What's up, Ninja Nerds? In this video today, we're going to be talking about the cell membrane. Before we get started, I really hope that if you guys do like this video, you find a lot of benefit from it, please support us. And one of the best ways that you really can do that is by hitting that like button, commenting on the comment section, but most importantly, please subscribe. Also, we got some awesome illustrations and notes that I really suggest you guys go down in the description box below, check out our website, and you guys can follow along with me as we go through this. I really think it'll enhance your learning experience. But let's talk about cell membrane. So when we go through the cell membrane, I want us to go through the structure and the function, right? So <clears throat> the two components here, the structure of the cell membrane. Well, first, what does the cell membrane do? Like, what's its kind of overall justificational purpose? Really, the cell membrane is just supposed to act as a barrier between the intracellular and the extracellular fluid. There's a lot of different components of it, though. So when you look at the structure, you see this kind of like black, thin membrane here? That's the cell membrane. And the cell membrane is made up of very, very special components of it. So this black part that we'll actually zoom in and look at here is called the membrane lipids. That's the first part that is actually super, super crucial. And there are so many different components here, such as phospholipids, such as the actual fatty acids, such as cholesterol. So we'll go through all of that. The second component here is going to be these orange proteins that are kind of spanning the cell membrane or linked on the inner or outer surface. These are called membrane proteins. And there's so many different types of these as well, and they have various different functions. Okay? And then the last component of the actual cell membrane is that you see on these actual proteins, these membrane proteins, they have like these little like extensions of lipids and sugar residues, which are represented by the pink and then this baby blue color. This is like glycoprotein glycolipid network on the outside of the cell. And it's really, really important, and we'll talk about it later, it's called the glycocalyx. So those are the three components that make up the structure of the cell membrane. Let's dive into each one of them and talk about it. So the first thing is the membrane lipid. So what I want to do is I want to take a piece of this actual cell membrane, and we're going to zoom in on it as you see here. And then on this side here, this is the extracellular fluid. So this is the fluid outside of the cell. And then here is the intracellular fluid, the fluid inside of the cell. So this is inside the cell, outside the cell. Now, when you zoom onto this membrane, you see a lot of different cool things, right? The first thing is you see these kind of like blue dots, if you will. So you see these blue circles? These are actually called your phospholipids. So there's an outer membrane, or outer membrane, inner membrane. And that's made up of the phospholipids. Okay, so the outer membrane and inner membrane have specifically something really, really cool, and it's made up of phosphates um, and sphingosides. Sphingosides, or sphingosines. Now these are really, really cool. So phosphates and sphingosines, basically, what I want you to remember is that they have a negatively charged surface to them. They're negatively charged. So phosphates have a negative charge to them, and sphingosines have a negative charge to it. The specific concept that I want you to understand is that these are actually associated on the outer membrane and on the inner membrane. Now, if you really wanted to look at it like this, the outer membrane is actually made up of very specific types of phosphate groups. One of them we call phosphatidylcholine. Another one is the sphingosines, and there's a very specific one here called sphingomyelin. Right? But these are basically going to be the phosphates and sphingosines that make up the outer membrane of the cell. On the inner membrane of the cell, it's still phosphates. We just give them a very specific type of phosphate component here. And these are called phosphatidylserine. And then there is other ones like ethanolamine. But basically, the big thing that I want you guys to understand here is that on this outer membrane and on this inner membrane, you have phosphates and sphingosines, which basically have a negative charge to them, which we'll talk about later gives them a certain degree of polarity. In other words, they love to interact with water because they have a charge to them. So therefore, this phosphate and sphingosine groups that are on the outer aspect of this phospholipid bilayer, they are hydrophilic. So this component here is hydrophilic, which is a beautiful concept here because it allows for it to interact with the extracellular fluid, which is water, and it's hydrophilic here, which allows for it to interact with the water in the intracellular fluid. So that's a really, really cool concept. All right, 
So we know now that the outer membrane and the inner membrane is made up of phosphates and sphingosines. Particularly in the outer, it's phosphatidylcholine and sphingomyelin. On the inner, it's phosphatidylserine, and if you really wanted the extra one here, I'll write it down. This one is called phosphatidylethanolamine. Ethanolamine is the other one. But basically, it's phosphate groups that have negatively charged that make them hydrophilic. That's really the big thing I want you to give. The second component is these like little red squiggly lines that are coming from the phosphate head. What is that? Those are fatty acids. So this component here that are coming from these phosphate heads is fatty acids. So the second component is going to be your fatty acid chains. Now the fatty acid chains are really important in the sense that they're made up of two types of fatty acids that are actually going to be a, uh, kind of stuck within the center part in between here. So in here is the fatty acids, all of these. And the big thing I want you to understand about these puppies here is that they are hydrophobic. They're hydrocarbon chains. They hate water. They do not want to be anywhere near water, and that's why they're tucked in between. They do not come into contact with the extracellular and intracellular fluid. Isn't that cool? So the fatty acid chains here, there's two types. They're saturated, which just means that it's kind of like these straight components here. A lot of hydrocarbon chains in there. Or it can be unsaturated, which may, may, may have a double bond in it, which gives it this special type of kink to the actual structure, which is really, really important. We'll talk about it later when we get into fluidity. But these are the big things that I really want you to understand. The last component here of the membrane lipids is going to be these kind of like pink structures, these pink circles that are kind of extended or kind of deposited into the cell membrane. You see how they're deposited into the cell membrane? This is cholesterol. This is cholesterol. And cholesterol is very, very important for the actual stability of the cell membrane. And we'll talk about later how cholesterol has a very significant involvement in what's called fluidity. So the big thing to understand as a quick recap here is we have again membrane lipids as one of the components here. What is it made up of? Three particular things. Outer membrane, inner membrane, which interact with the water between the intracellular and extracellular fluid is having these phosphates, the phosphate head of the phospholipids, or if you really want to be a little advanced, these things called sphingosines. On the outer, sphingomyelin, and phosphatidylcholine. On the inner, phosphatidylserine, phosphatidylethanolamine. Big thing to understand is they're negatively charged, so they very nicely interact with water because they're polar. In the inner, in between, coming extending from the phosphate and sphingosine heads, in the center is these hydrocarbon fatty acid chains. They're saturated, meaning no double bond. Unsaturated has a double bond, which gives a little kink to it. We'll talk about why that's important later. But these, hydrophobic, they don't like that water, so that's why they do not interact with the fluid of the intracellular and extracellular fluid. And then lastly, cholesterol is deposited into the cell membrane as well. These are the big components. Let's now come down and talk about the next important component of the cell membrane. And these are the membrane proteins. So membrane proteins are really, really cool, and they can actually be completely spanning the entire cell membrane. You see how it goes from the outer membrane all the way to the inner membrane, and allows for a connection, if you will, where maybe certain things can kind of travel in or <clears throat> travel out. These are really, really cool. These proteins, because they span the entire membrane, we call these integral or a specific type, a transmembrane protein. So again, what is this one here? So this one here, specifically, it spans the entire cell membrane. This can be called an integral. This is an integral protein but a very specific type of it, it spans the entire membrane, which is the most common type of integral protein. This is called a transmembrane protein. And this is a great example of like your ion channels or your carrier proteins. These basically have the ability to interact with the extracellular fluid and the intracellular fluid. So that's a pretty cool concept. The other ones are proteins that basically are linked kind of like very, very weakly. So in other words, they may have like slight positive charges, slight positive charges that allow for them to be able to interact with the phosphate groups because phosphates are negative and sphingosines are negative. These are called peripheral proteins. So these are called peripheral proteins. And again, I think the big thing to understand here is that integral proteins, you see how they're completely spanning the entire membrane? These have a strong, 
kind of lipid bond. So they have a very intimate kind of like strong bond between the phospholipid bilayer, very strong. Whereas this one here, your peripheral proteins, these have a weak type of lipid bond. In other words, they do not love to interact with them, so it's a very weak, more like hydrogen bonding. So if you really wanted to remember, this one's your hydrogen bonding, where this one may be more of an un un unstrong, like kind of covalent bond. So these are very, very strong bonds, and that's another important concept to take away. All right, so that covers, again, membrane proteins. These are proteins which either completely are in, in kind of invaginated into the cell membrane, and they may span the entire membrane, transmembrane, this is an integral type, or they can have a weak interaction with the cell membrane, electrostatic hydrogen bonding, and they do not span it. These are peripheral proteins. Okay, next thing is let's talk about the glycocalyx. All right, so the next component here is the glycocalyx. So the glycocalyx is really interesting. So we have the protein structure here, right? So here's our proteins that are basically, again, you could have the two types, the integral, which if it spans the whole membrane, it's called transmembrane, or if it's kind of see, you know, softly linked to the inner or outer surface, again, these are the peripheral proteins. But sometimes these proteins can have these kind of like sugar residues kind of linked up to them, right? So we're going to just call this a sugar residue. Really, it's just kind of like an oligosaccharide. And so when you have a protein and a sugar kind of combined, we call that a glycoprotein. And so this makes like this really, really powerful network on the outside of the cell. So this is called your glycoproteins. And this is one big thing. The other component, which is also kind of crucial, is that sometimes you have some of these kind of like lipid molecules I'm sorry, uh, sugar molecules, which kind of come off of the cell membrane. And so because the cell membrane is primarily kind of a lipid complex, if you have these sugar residues, again, this is another sugar residue, kind of linking off of the cell membrane. And the cell membrane was primarily lipids, phospholipids, fatty acids, cholesterol. Then this would be called a glycolipid. So sometimes we can also have these glycolipids. And really the combination of these glycolipids and these glycoproteins kind of form this mesh network on the outside of the cell. And that's what's called your glycocalyx. So what I want to do now is we've covered all the structures. We've covered the membrane lipids with the components of it. So the phosphates and the sphingosines, the fatty acids, the cholesterol. We cover the membrane proteins, the integral or the peripheral and we cover the glycocalyx, which is the glycoprotein and glycolipid structure on the outer surface of the cell. Now we gotta do is go through each one of those and talk about what are the functions of the membrane lipids? What are the functions of the membrane proteins? What are the functions of the glycocalyx? Let's do that now. All right, my friends, so let's actually start talking about the functions of the cell membrane. So first one is the glycocalyx, right? It's the easiest one, so we'll cover that one first. Then we'll go into the membrane lipids. They're just a little bit harder of a function, and then we'll finish off with membrane proteins. They got a ton of functions. So, First thing is when we talk about the cell membrane, again, we know the three components, right? Glycocalyx is one of those. Glycocalyx is made up of the glycoprotein glycolipid network on the outside of the cell. And what that's really good for is two particular things. One is that this really helps the cell to be able to hold on to water. So it's really good at being able to regulate the movement of water kind of in and out of the cell. It's really, really good at that. And so what it's designed to be able to do is to decrease cell dehydration. That's a really great thing about this glycocalyx is that it's really, really good at being able to reduce the dehydration of the cell because it controls the movement of water in and out of the cell because of this crazy kind of glycoprotein and glycolipid, can't forget about that puppy there, network on the outside of the cell. All right, so that's one particular thing. The second thing, which is actually really, really cool, is antigenic function. So it has a very important type of anti genic function. You're like, what that mean, man? So <laughs> antigenic function is, it's really what allows for our cells, our immune system cells, to recognize something as though if it's host or if it's foreign. It's not supposed to be there. It's abnormal. I'll give you two examples. One is with respect to our immune system. So our immune system is a really, really great example of one. So here's a host cell and here's a foreign cell. On this host cell, it has a very specific type of network of glycoproteins and glycolipids that maybe will make up, you don't have to memorize this, I just want you to understand it, maybe this whole kind of structure here on this host cell makes up something called a MHC1 complex. And we'll talk about this later when we get into immunology, but this is what basically helps us to recognize a normal human you know, nucleated cell from a foreign cell.
So this is a very specific type of structure, a very specific one. So the immune system cells will come and what they'll do is they'll read and they'll say, okay, okay, this cell definitely has, I can, can detect that that's a normal MHC1 complex, it's a normal glycocalyx. Whereas if I go over here and I try to recognize this one, this one is not a glycocalyx that I actually recognize. It does not have that very classic MHC1 component. So this is not a MHC1 component. So therefore, I'm going to kill this cell and keep this cell alive and healthy. And so that's one of the cool ways. So it helps with being able to control our immune system, being able to recognize if something is foreign versus our own. And the same concept, we can think about this with red blood cells. So red blood cells have these specific antigens on them, these specific glycocalyx molecules that gives them the blood type A, gives them the blood type B, gives them the blood type AB, or they have none of them, none of these, and so we call that O, right? So all of these different types of proteins basically help us to recognize what type of blood type the patient has. So it's really, really cool, right? So it's very helpful in blood typing. And so that's one way is it can help to recognize our cells, our red blood cells of the person versus another person's who maybe doesn't have the specific A or the B or the AB. Maybe these are very different. So maybe this donor's is some type of different red blood cell. So let's say that in this patient, maybe all of these, his blood type, these MH, uh, these uh, glycocalyx proteins all represented type A blood. And then you give them this donor, which represents type B blood. This may not be a compatible type of blood typing. And that's an important thing. So it would help our actual immune system cells to be able to recognize that this is foreign, not our actual blood cell that we should accept. And this one is good because it can recognize these different types of antigens on the surface, the glycocalyx proteins. And if it no notices something that's different, it'll actually release antibodies to bind to the donor red blood cell proteins and cause them to clump and destroy. Whereas it will not release any types of antibodies to actually combine with these proteins, these glycocalyx proteins, to cause it not to agglutinate and therefore not to clot. So that's a really, really cool thing. So the big things that I want you to take away from the glycocalyx is that it prevents cell dehydration and it plays a very, very important role in acting in antigenic function, recognizing our cells from foreign cells. And that's a really important thing with the example of the immune system and blood typing. Okay, now let's come and talk about the membrane lipids and all the functions they have. All right, so when we talk about the next component, which is the membrane lipids, so we know that glycocalyx is important for antigenic function and preventing cell dehydration. The second thing is the membrane lipids. Now, membrane lipids are really, really cool, right? And in a very specific way, there's two very important components to the function of membrane lipids. One is called fluidity. So it's the ability of the cell to adapt its shape and movement, and it's really, really cool. And I'll give you a great example of that when we get over into the next part of the lecture here. But with fluidity, there's three important factors that you guys will be tested on that influences the degree of the actual cell to adapt its shape and movement. In other words, does it want to be rigid and, and a very tight structure, not a lot of movement going on, or does it want to be a little bit more relaxed, open, and allow for more movement and mobility? So the three important components that influence that, my friends, very, very important, is temperature. So temperature has a very profound effect on fluidity. So hot and cold. The next one is the presence of cholesterol. So cholesterol, believe it or not, I told you it has a very important component to the stability of the cell membrane. It controls fluidity of the cell membrane. And the last one is the types of fatty acids. And you guys remember the fatty acids that are basically in the center of that actual structure to the actual cell membrane, right? We said that there's the fatty acids, or the hydrocarbon chains, which are the hydrophobic portion. Now, these are the three things that affect fluidity, the ability of the cell to adapt its shape and movement. Now, let's think about this, and what I really wanna do is I wanna talk about what will basically, with these particular factors, increase or decrease fluidity. So if we increase fluidity, what do you notice? There's a lot of space between the phospholipids in all of these structures. There's a lot of space. Do you notice that between each one of these? If there's a lot of space, there's a lot of degree of movement here as well. So there's an increased fluidity, increased space between the phospholipids, and increased kind of movement. Now, with temperature, I just want you to make it too very, very simple. If it's really, really hot, really, really hot, you're going to want to be sitting close to somebody, 
No, because they're radiating heat on you, you're radiating heat on them. So that's a similar kind of concept. That's why I want you to remember it. So at very, very high temperatures, the fluidity will increase because I want you to think about the phospholipids just kind of separating from one another. And this is very, very crucial when it actually comes to the presence without cholesterol. The other concept is if we decrease fluidity. So if it's high temperatures, whenever it's really, really cold, what do you want to do? You want to snuggle up to somebody. You want to get close to your friend, your family member, your dog, whatever it may be to kind of get really, really warm, right? So that you guys can radiate heat on each other. So you guys get close to one another. And so at really, really low temperatures, especially in the presence without cholesterol, I need to write this down, especially without cholesterol, then these dang phospholipids will get tight with one another and the cell membrane will get rigid and very, very tight. And again, not allow for a lot of movement and mobility of the phospholipids. Same concept here, cholesterol. Cholesterol, I want you to think about when cholesterol is present in high amounts, it really causes the phospholipids to come and stick. Imagine it like glue. So if there's lots of cholesterol, it'll, it'll act like a glue to stick the phospholipids close to one another. If there's very little cholesterol, the phospholipids won't have the glue to stick with one another and they'll drift apart. So in this situation, this would be very little cholesterol. Very little cholesterol. And then in this particular, so again, here's the one specific example. When cholesterol is low, you would think, oh, that increased fluidity. But Zach, you said over here that low temperatures without cholesterol. This is the only other exception that when cholesterol is low, if it's at cold temps, it'll compact the actual phospholipids down. But if we go over here, lots and lots and lots of cholesterol, guess what? Phospholipids are going to stick to one another really nicely now. And so that's going to be, again, this concept here for a decre decrease in fluidity. Now. Last one here is types of fatty acids. This one's actually really cool. So remember I told you that there's two types of fatty acids. One is it's saturated, and saturated kind of gives you this straight, beautiful line like this one. And then unsaturated has a double bond, and the double bond gives a little kink to the structure. Now imagine if I'm trying to sit next to somebody, and I'm like this, legs wide open, arms wide open, can the phospholipids be close to one another? No, and so they separate out very far from one another. Whereas if I'm like a saturated, I'm kind of sitting on the plane like this, with hate in my life, right? Really, really close, arms close together, legs close together, I can fit a lot of things on the side of me. So that's the same kind of concept here, that if we want to increase fluidity, put some kinks into the mix. That's not a little weird, but you want to basically increase the amount of unsaturated fatty acids. And that'll basically increase the spacing and increase the fluidity. If I want to make it to where it's really tight, kind of compact structure, then I'll basically increase the amount of my saturated fatty acids. No double bond, no kink, and therefore these can kind of tightly compact one another. And this is the concept that I want you to understand about fluidity. This is very commonly tested. All right, now that we understand one of the big functions of the membrane lipids, let's talk about one more, which is again going into the transport concept. All right, so the next thing with membrane lipids, not only is their fluidity is a very important concept, very commonly tested, guys. Please don't forget that, please. The next thing is there's a concept of transport, so the movement of things. And this could be things that are actually moving across the cell membrane, or it could be things that are moving within the cell membrane. You didn't think that you hear that, right? But it's pretty cool. So one of the concepts that I want to talk about is this concept of like, like simple diffusion across the membrane. So across the membrane. And this is really, really cool. So when you think about it, the um, cell membrane is a phospholipid bilayer. Phosphates on one side, phosphates on the other side, and then the fatty acids in the core of it, right? That's what we know. Phosphates and sphingosines are on the inner and outer because they're negatively charged, hydrophilic, and then fatty acids, hydrophobic in the inner side. Now, what's really, really important is that certain substances have the capability of moving across this cell membrane, in and out. But the way that these things move across is because the lipid bilayer has on this inner surface these fatty acids, it's very, very hydrophobic, right? So again, the hydrophilic component is, yes, this thing on the outside, but this is the problem here. It's this is the problem, this component, the hydrophobic component. So whenever things have to move through, they have to be able to dissolve within this hydrophobic component. And so examples of things that are able to move across here is things like oxygen and CO2. That's one. Another one is things that are like uh, small, small structures. So very, very tiny structures. 
Um, other things that are really, really important here are things that are lipid soluble. And so lipid soluble structures, so steroid hormones is a really, really big one as well. So it really has to be small, nonpolar, or lipid soluble to be able to simply diffuse without any kind of ATP involvement, but to dissolve across the cell membrane. And I like to remember that like dissolves like. So if it's small, nonpolar, and lipid soluble, it's just like the cell membrane. It'll easily dissolve and move across the cell membrane. So I want you to use that terminology that like dissolves like. That because this cell membrane, especially the inner component, is hydrophobic, it's nonpolar, we need things that are very, very tiny that can fit between the hydrophobic tails or between the phosphate groups. Or we need something that's nonpolar, like the hydrophobic tails, or hydrophobic, in other words, uh, lipid soluble, that can diffuse easily across the cell membrane. That's one concept. The other one is diffusion within the membrane. Diffusion within the membrane. And I just think that this is super, super cool. I don't want you guys to get too crazy. I just find it so fascinating that when you think about the cell membrane, right, we know that we have these phosphate groups and we know that we have the phosphate groups on the inside and the outside and then we have the hydrophobic tails. Do you know that they can move? I could literally move this phosphate group here to here and I could move this phosphate group from here to here and it's constantly happening. They're constantly moving, the phospholipids are constantly moving from side to side within the membrane. You know what they call this? They call this lateral diffusion. So they literally call this lateral diffusion. <clears throat> and what's really cool is if you were to tag, let's say that you just tagged one of these phosphate groups and you were to follow it, you would see it just moving all around the cell membrane. It's so cool. The other concept here is that if I have a phosphate group here, I could move it to the inner membrane. So I could move it from the outer membrane to the inner membrane, or if I wanted to move this from the inner membrane to the outer membrane, I could do that as well. So you can flip flop back and forth between the actual inner and outer membrane. So if you were to tag one of these phosphate groups, you'd be able to see it at some point, maybe on the inner membrane, maybe later you'd see it on the outer membrane, maybe later you'd see it on the inner membrane. That's called transverse diffusion. Transverse diffusion. And we need specific enzymes really that help us to perform that type of task. And I just remember it by where they're going. So if it's going from uh, inner to outer, then it's a flop haze. I'm not even kidding, I'm not making this up. It's literally called a flop haze. <laughs> and then if it's going from the outer to the inner, then this one is called a flip haze. I wish I was making this up. But these are enzymes that are basically helping to move these phospholipids from one end to the other, from the outer to inner, inner to outer. It's really cool. But that covers the basic concept of the membrane lipids. So fluidity is one really, really important component, knowing the three things that influences that temperature, cholesterol, and types of fatty acids, knowing that the transport across the cell membrane is important, so simple diffusion of small, nonpolar lipid-soluble molecules that easily dissolves across the cell membrane, and then lastly, knowing that the phospholipids can actually easily travel along the cell membrane in a lateral pattern, or they can flip flop back and forth between the outer and the inner membrane. And then now what we're gonna do is talk about the membrane proteins and their function. All right, my friends, so now we're gonna talk about the membrane functions, particularly pertaining to the membrane proteins. So this is the integral proteins, which is specifically the transmembrane protein and the peripheral proteins. What can they do? There's a lot of things that these things can do. So we told you that the membrane lipids only allow for what type of diffusion? Simple diffusion of small, nonpolar, lipid-soluble molecules. Well, there's a lots of other molecules that are large, polar, and water-soluble. What about those? How do they get across the cell membrane? We need transport proteins to be incorporated into the cell membrane, transmembrane proteins, to act as channels or carriers to move those large, polar, and water-soluble molecules across the cell. So, we may need, again, this type of channel protein. So this is a channel protein. This may be a carrier protein. And what they may do is, is they allow for what type of transport? Very large, large, polar, and what else? Water soluble transport of things across the cell. So that's really, really important. So it allow for things like 
charged molecules to move across the cell, allow for things like proteins to be able to move across the cell. So that's really, really, really important. Now, another really cool concept here is that proteins are not only involved kind of in being embedded into the cell membrane, they can be transient. In other words, they can kind of move and attach. So remember these peripheral proteins? Maybe there's peripheral proteins that are on the inner cell membrane. You know, here may be molecules that I want to either move to the cell membrane to release, and we call this exocytosis, so exocytosis. Or maybe there's molecules that I want to bring in to the actual cell. So this is called endocytosis. This is another example of where proteins can kind of cooperate this process. And you know what's really also cool? Look how the phospholipids of this vesicle fuses with the lipids of this cell membrane. Look at how the phospholipids of this cell membrane forms this phospholipids of that vesicle. That's an example of fluidity. So I love this example of exocytosis and endocytosis because this is one of the perfect examples of these two exhibiting a concept of fluidity. I just think it's so darn cool how that happens. But that's one of the functions of membrane proteins is they allow for transport of very large water-soluble polar molecules across the cell membrane that wouldn't easily dissolve across the lipid-soluble hydrophobic fatty acid tails of the actual cell membrane. Remember, like dissolves like. What's another function? Well, let's say here I have a vesicle, and this vesicle, in order for me to be able to stimulate it to fuse with the cell membrane and release these particular molecules, I have to have a hormone. Let's say this is a hormone. It has to bind onto a particular type of receptor. And when it activates or stimulates this receptor, it sends signals that then will fuse, actually activating this vesicle to fuse with the cell membrane. So it may activate some type of second messenger system, which is actually pretty cool. So there's another function. It allows for me to be able to take an extracellular, so this is the extracellular fluid, Here's the intracellular fluid. It allows for something in the extracellular fluid to stimulate a protein, trigger a signal in the cell, and then produce a response. That's another important concept of proteins. Another cool function is they can link a cell one and cell two together. So there may be <clears throat> these integral proteins that are on the outer surface of the cell that link to the uh, integral proteins of another cell. And that's a really cool concept. We'll talk about these a little bit later. Um, <clears throat> when we get to cell junctions, but this could be things like tight junctions, All right? We'll talk about these. This could be things like your desmosomes, All right? We'll talk about these. This could be things like adherence junctions, and we'll talk about these. So this is a really cool concept of where you have these structures that allow for cells to link up with one another. If by some chance you understand pathology, where maybe I destroy these cell adhesions and the cells can't stick with one another and they start separating. That's an important concept. Okay, what else? We come down here, we know that the next functions that are also really, really key here is gonna be enzymatic function. Believe it or not, let's say that there's actually some type of um, enzyme out here, let's say, or some type of substrate. So we usually we represent substrates as A plus B, right? Maybe there's an enzyme here on the outer surface of the cell. And in order for this to be able to become activated and turn into C, let's just say C plus D, C plus D, this is the reaction. We use this as a common reaction. This enzyme, this is our enzyme, he's the one that catalyzes or stimulates the acceleration in this particular step. So he will allow for the increased speed of reaction. Same concept, maybe it's inside of the cell. Maybe it doesn't have to just be outside the cell. A plus B will have to interact with this enzyme and make C plus D. He will stimulate, this is an enzyme, this is an enzyme, and they may stimulate the intracellular and extracellular synthesis of particular types of substrates. That's a really cool concept. So, so far we got transport. We also have what other thing? Transport, we have cell-to-cell -cell communication, we have a receptor, we also allow for enzymatic function. Another one is cell communication. So again, cell one, cell two. Maybe I want this cell to become activated. So I want ions, positive ions, to flow from this cell into this cell. You know what we call these, and they're very common in muscle cells, gap junctions. So this is another example of something that we'll talk about later when we talk about cell junctions called gap junctions. Very cool concept. The last but not least thing that's actually really important here is gonna be the cell attachment to the extracellular matrix. 
So, you know, whenever we have cells like epithelial cells, epithelial cells, they love to connect with the outside surface sometimes to give stability to the cell membrane. So sometimes we have like little connective tissue structures that are nearby. Here's some connective tissue. Okay, so here's gonna be the connective tissue that we're zooming in on. So here's this, we're zooming in on this connective tissue that these cells are linked with. In order for us cell to kind of be really strengthened to the outside surfaces, in this case, the connective tissue lining or the basal lamina, we need the proteins of the cell membrane to link with the connective tissue of the extracellular matrix. And this is that connection right here, these linkage between the two. And this is important because there's a lot of different things that do this. A lot of different structures, right? But this is a really, really important thing that I need you guys to understand. One great example is like hemidesmosomes. They actually allow for that kind of process here. So we can call one of these as an example is hemidesmosomes. In this video, we will be discussing the structure of the cell membrane. When scientists looked at the selectively permeable cell membrane, they described its structure as a fluid mosaic. You might know that a mosaic is a picture made up of little tiles. Like a mosaic, the cell membrane is made up of different parts as well. The cell membrane has two layers of phospholipids, referred to as a lipid bilayer. The lipid bilayer isn't rigid. The phospholipids in it have the ability to move in a flexible, wave-like motion. Let's take a closer look at a few phospholipids. The round head portions are hydrophilic, which means they are attracted to water. Both the extracellular fluid meaning fluid outside the cell, and the cytoplasm inside the cell, are mostly made up of water. So the hydrophilic phospholipid heads of the outer layer will be oriented toward the extracellular fluid, and the heads of the inner layer will be oriented toward the cytoplasm. The phospholipid tails are hydrophobic, which means watery areas repel them. So they orient toward each other in a direction as far away from the watery content as possible. There are also scattered proteins embedded in the phospholipid layers, some with carbohydrates attached. So in the fluid mosaic model, the cell membrane is made up of different parts and these parts make up a flexible boundary around the cell. But how do the majority of substances get in or out of the cell? Some molecules seep through the little spaces in between the phospholipids, which make up the majority of the semi-permeable cell membrane. However, other molecules are too big to fit through the cell membrane this way. So how do these larger molecules pass through the cell membrane? the molecules move through proteins embedded in the cell membrane, either from the extracellular area into the cell or from the intracellular area out of the cell. These substances will move through tunnels made up of these proteins. We'll explore how things move through the cell membrane in greater detail separately. So that really covers all the functions of the membrane proteins, the membrane lipids, the glycocalyx, and all the components of the cell membrane. I hope it made sense. I hope that you guys enjoyed it. And as always, until next time.